So this morning, um, as part of our summer program, we're going to hear from one of our members. Um, just to give you a little intro about who I am before <laughs> um, we move on, um, I'm Sherry Pollock. I'm a co-chair of our Sunday program committee, a member of our rotating group of moderators, um, and a member since 2013. And when my family and I came to check this place out in 2012 and um, see, if, see what we thought about the Golden Rule Sunday School and attend our first program, one of the first people we met was Matt Cole. Um, he was very friendly and warm and welcoming and one of the reasons why we came back, but he was also very familiar. <laughs> And a quick uh, browse through my photo album revealed that we had actually met each other decades before when Matt was doing his student teaching at Shute Middle School where I was attending eighth grade. <laughs> so it, <laughs> um, in the years in between, Matt, I think, has been a member of the society for about the last 20 years where he has been on pretty much every committee and held pretty much every job from changer of light bulbs to president of the board of trustees. So I am very honored to introduce and welcome Matt to tell us a little bit about himself. Sure, is one of my best students, my <laughs> best, best students. And you know, she said I could change light bulbs. That's like one of these jokes, how many mats? Take, never mind. <laughs> So uh, first, I welcome you this morning. And it was a tough night for all of us. And to not mention it, it's like the, you know, the girl in the room. And uh, I woke up this morning, and my phone rang. And I looked there, and said there was a shooting in Dayton. And I couldn't believe it. And it's just so, it breaks my heart. And it's, it breaks all our hearts, I'm sure. And it's really hard to give a presentation on humor, which includes a few things that are probably associated with violence. Uh, on today where my heart is breaking and uh, I don't know how to, this society writes letters of condolence when something happens or makes a speech at a church or a synagogue, but how do you do it to a bar? How do you do it to a Walmart? I'm a gun owner, this stuff is out of control and it's just, I'm also a science teacher and a correlation of one means you should do something and if, if every shooting is a gun involved, and I'm a gun owner by the way, uh, it's nuts. So uh, anyway, just uh, I'm going to start this thing. This place is always finding faults. As soon as I walked in here, John Ungeshek immediately told me that it's not it, not August second, but it was close. It was it was within a standard deviation. It was a, it, you know, it's, it was okay. So we're going to try to do this. Uh, good morning. I'm glad to see so many of friends here. Uh, as a former middle school teacher, I promise to do my best. And that the kids, I hope that the kids learn something and smiled a few times, but a limited smile. The same thing goes this morning. I speak Brooklyn fast, so your job is to listen fast. If you miss it, it's your problem. Okay, I also mumble. So my suggestion is to overlook what I say. Besides, nothing I say this morning is gonna be very important. Uh, let's get to the next slide. This will screw up sometime. Look at that. First time. It says here, my brother-in-law, Lou Greenwald, there, where is, where's Lou? It's always good to bring family. It fills up the audience. Uh, and our friend Susan Stone. Is Susan here? Susan here. Okay, they're both here. Uh, both accomplished storytellers. They really are. And they tell me humor is often part of our personal story. So, so I thought I would start with a little story uh, about me being a teacher. Uh, Jeff Dunham over here says you shouldn't use a crutch, you know, a prop to do humor. Uh, I lost it. It's gone. There it is. So I'm going to use this one. You've probably never seen this before. But here. So I'm going to tell you. Wow. I'm going to tell you this story. Seriously. I was, in, in Evanston, we used to take the kids to outdoor education. At Camp Timberley in Wisconsin. And then when they came back, we showed them pictures. They were on real slides. And I'm showing the pictures after the trip. And a kid raises his hand. And he says, Mr. Cole, 
why are you wearing a Groucho Marx nose and glasses? And I wasn't. <laughs> so I have never forgotten that. He didn't mean it, but it was great. Uh, OK. See, years ago, and at my age, everything is years ago, uh, I did a short presentation on humor in grad school. And it was easy, because there was nothing published on humor. Well, this time I screwed up, because when I volunteered to do a thing on humor, there's tons and tons of stuff on humor. So I chose, I called it down to three books. They're over there. If anybody wants to borrow them, you can take them home and see that everything is underlined, which doesn't help when you're trying to make a short presentation. I mean, everything. But there's some blue and there's some yellow. It's pretty. Uh, so here's what I did. I did this. Uh, well, let's get to the next one. I should have gone to the next slide. Oh, it's over here. There it is. Uh, this is the one in the middle. The one in the middle is Roger is uh, Robert Provine. He's a professor of neuroscience at University of uh, Maryland. Brilliant guy. You know, does a lot of research for ten years. He's in re researching laughter. Uh, Scott Means is the one on on, on uh, the. That's the right, right? Yeah, that's the right up there. Uh, he was also a former professor at the University of Maryland. It must have really been a funny place. He also is in charge of, of something called Hurl, which is a strange name, but it's a humor research lab. And the last one is the humor code, and that is by, I forgot the guy's name, uh, by Peter McGraw, who's a professor of linguistics at the University of Colorado, Boulder, and uh, he's the director of Hurl. I'm sorry, I was hurling the wrong one. And he teamed up with a, with a, uh, a freelance writer, because he can't write. And then each book starts this way, I promise you. And each one starts with this quote. Humor can be dissected as a frog can, but the thing dies in the process. And they credit that to Andre Mouroui, Mouroui, I can't, can't do French, Mark Twain, or E.B. Wright. So nobody knows who actually said it. And then. Each of the authors then proceeds to dissect humor, which I think is kind of hypocritical. Uh, but then I also thought it would be kind of nice to you know, start with you know, a real class. So uh, philosophers are always classy. And um, well, they are. Who, anybody, anybody a philosopher here? No? Go back to school. OK. So uh, I had, there's a lot of philosophers. And I decided to pick Plato, and that's either this one or this one. They both have beards, and they're both statues. I don't know which one it is. I think this, I, I'm pretty sure this one is Socrates, and this one's Plato. Uh, Darwin, that's this guy, this guy here. Freud, he's holding a cigar. <laughs> don't laugh. And, uh, and who did I miss? Oh, this one up here, which I really didn't know. And, uh, <laughs> His name is, what's that? Matt, that's the funny thing, is when you point to your screen, we don't see any of them. I have a degree in technology. Wait a second. I actually even have a pointer here. That was not nice. Give me a pointer. That was funny. I could point up there. Uh, OK. The guy on the upper left is Bergson, uh, and Andre Bergson. Underneath is Freud, he's the guy with the cigar, I told you that. Darwin over there, the two statues of Socrates and Plato. Are you through now? Um, I left out a bunch. I left out Descartes. I apologize to him. Thank you. Has this blind you? Just checking. Uh, I was looking at this thing. This, this is a painting, never mind. We will not tolerate hecklers today. OK, shh. Anyway, I'm going to say what these guys said. Uh, Aristotle said, humor and wit are gentle forms of e educated insolence. And, Aris and uh, that's what Aristotle. And hold on, i got a mismix here. Plato wrote, laughter is a malicious element associated with the derision of our the derision of our inferiors. So Plato really doesn't like humor. Socrates, Aristotle is a, is a little, a little less uh, strict. Freud said, unlike cigars, jokes are more than they seem. 
And all laugh-producing situations are pleasurable because they save some psychic energy. It's like a safety valve. Darwin said, hmm, other primates laugh. Laughter could be evolutionary, an evolutionary step to speech. Henry Bergson said, all laughter is inherently social. My own belief is all these guys are probably right. I'm not sure about Freud because I never understood Freud, but I tried. Uh, so we're going to try something first. On the count of three, look at your neighbor right in the eye and just say, laugh. Try it. One, two, three. Do, did anybody get a chuckle out of the person next to them? Good. OK. Well, if that didn't work, Let's try this over here. This should work, I hope. This makes me laugh. Oh, I knew that was going to happen. But I fixed it. That was cool. Fix it again. I don't like this thing. Come on, let's go. I knew you would laugh to see you. you guys like you're like you know you're like you're like Aristotle and Plato. Okay, uh, was 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 this was this clip a malicious element associated with the derision of an inferior, a gentle form of educated insolence? Did someone save did some someone save some psychic energy, whatever that means, or did you f feel like laughter was an evolutionary step to speech? Or is your laughter a form of social behavior? Um, my guess is a little bit of all, except I'm not sure about Freud. Uh, so I'm going to go to this next next thing. If I don't screw it up too badly, I did. So I, people recognize me around here by the hat, my mumbling, my making mistakes, and wearing goofy t-shirts. Uh, this morning I couldn't wear, most of my t-shirts are full of derision, they cast you know, negative things against anti-scientific people, not very nice to religion. You know, they can be really nasty. This morning I couldn't do that, because it's a sa sad morning. So this one's about my grandkids, and I can't think anything further than nasty. But this is the first t-shirt I, oh, up there, up there, I got it, I got it. This t-shirt up there, slow learner. It's the first one I ever bought. And I got it in Galena, and I laughed. And to this day, I don't know why it's funny. <laughs> but maybe we can figure it out later. But I, you know, it still makes me laugh. No. Let's go to the next one. Come on, be good. Be nice. Wow. This one I don't wear anymore. And uh, see, somebody, seventh grade boys love this t-shirt. Love this t-shirt. They were hysterical. It's a cat versus a vegematic. So you can get you know, a, a crinkle cut cat. Uh, you know, you know, it's a, a blended cat. You know, it's, it's, it's really fabulous. Uh, but one day I wore this t-shirt to my vet. <laughs> and there was a lady sitting in the back of the room, an older lady, younger than me, but old. And she. <laughs> She had this cute little box on her, and there was a little cat inside. And she looked at me, and it was murder. So I never, ever wore that shirt again. I guess it went too far. I'm going to go to the next one. And this one's even worse. <laughs> See, I, didn't, I really did not. I liked, my, I liked my cats along the side of the highway. And this thing is, was really bad, but I kind of forgot about it until I went to my favorite Asian restaurant <laughs> called Sing Tao in, Evans, in, in Wilmette. The looks were not good. This shirt has never been worn in the last 12 years. It's still a great shirt. Uh, the next one is a little more interesting. Uh, this, is, this over here has a, a George Carlin quote. It says, never underestimate the power of stupid people in large groups. And I bought the shirt during the 2016 election. And I, I, I'm a bowler, and at my bowling alley, there's one deplorable guy. And he is deplorable, truly deplorable. He wears shirts with Muslims and targets. He's just an 
he, he brags about having 30,000 rounds of ammunition at home. He once asked me, he told me he was shooting targets. And I said, what do you shoot? And he said, cans. I said, okay. And he said, Africans and Mexicans. So this guy is disgusting. He's absolutely disgusting. So I'm wearing the shirt. He walks up to me and he says, are you making fun of me? <laughs> I didn't realize he had so much introspection. <laughs> So I've since come to love that shirt. And I think he's actually going to quit the bowling league. I hope he's, he's not a good, he is a good bowler though. He's just a terrible, terrible human being. So most, uh, I usually don't read things up there because I can't even find them. But it says, most experts today subscribe to some sort of variation of the un incongruity theory. The idea that humor arises when people discover there is an inconsistency between what they expect to happen and what actually happens. And I think that's kind of true. So we're going to go on and try to go to the next one. Jewish comedians. In 1979, Time magazine wrote an article and said 80% of the comedians in the United States were Jewish. It's not the same anymore, but it's, it's, it's still, we're, we're, we are, oh, by the way, I'm Jewish, by the way. We're over, you never would have guessed. For the Groucho Marx nose on again. Uh, but, these guys really are the experts. They're phenomenal. So Groucho Marx, Billy Crystal, Jackie Mason, Rodney Dangerfield, Mel Brooks, and George Burns. So my brother-in-law is really critical, is going to read the joke that he thinks is the funniest. Where are you? Where are you, Louie? There he is. Read aloud, Lou. My wife and I were happy for 20 years. Then we met. <laughs> so the, the first part and the second, the two clauses just don't quite make it. They conflict. And you don't expect the second one. Uh, I don't know which one I like the best. Uh, I, they're all good. I like Mel Brooks because it has to do with comedy. It says, tragedy is when I cut my finger. Comedy is when you fall into an open sewer and die. <laughs> so, it's a great line. Uh, and it, 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 it always follows like punchlines. And I, I read some, one of these books that punchlines either come from Punch and Judy or they come from the the English mag British magazine Punch. Either way, it's a, a punch. Now, what's the next thing? So babies experience incongruity already. There's a little baby. Peekaboo is, I think, is a great example of incon incongruity. The baby thinks that the parent isn't there permanently. Whoop! We're gonna go back. Don't do that. Okay, I did it right. <coughs> <laughs> That's great. And it keeps going. It's fun. So, uh, let's go back again. And then there's this other theory. It seems that guys who write books like theory, and this is the benign violation theory. Humor only occurs when something seems wrong, unsettling, or threatening, which is the violation, uh, but simultaneously seems OK, acceptable, or safe. It's benign. So uh, well, who would be your best example, if you go back to your childhood, who did things that really seemed awful, but people just didn't get hurt? Come on, volunteer. I, I came home from school in, in, in sixth grade. We had schools, and, and I came home, and I would tune into this. Yeah, who? The Three Stooges. By the way, Mo went to my high school a few years before. But he really did. He scored better than I did. So uh, let's go back. Next one. Come on. There they are, Three Stooges. So we're going to watch them Three Stooges. I kind of like this. I'm Laurel, I'm Laurel and Hart. My greatest one, I love that. I love it.
deserve a hand. They're really good. All right. Uh, humor is contagious. When one person starts laughing, the other person usually laughs. It's almost people people who laugh alone usually are put away. I mean, it's it's just people just are just laughing alone. You know. I mean, seriously, it's very very hard to make people laugh by themselves. And every one of my books talks about this thing that happened in in January 30th, 1962, in. Tanzania, and uh, kids are in school. Three, three girls, and one of the, gr the girl, three girls started laughing. Within a month and a half, 95 out of 159 girls could not stop laughing. They sent the kids back home, and they were they were 12 to 18. It didn't affect any of the boys, and didn't affect any of the staff. They went. Uh, <coughs> They went back home. They actually cl they closed the school on March 18th, and they went back home to a town called Nishamba. If I'm pronouncing it wrong, I apologize. Uh, but nobody here is Nishambis. Uh, no good. Okay. Anyway, uh, it spread to that town, and in April and May, more, almost all the girls that 217 kids were laughing. Now it was boys and girls, but not too many adults. And that uh, in a nearby the middle, the middle school broke out. Forty-eight girls were laughing. In 18 months, the epidemic finally died off, and all 14 schools were shut down, and over a thousand victims. It was really very destructive. There was also a lawsuit. They had one Jewish guy. No, they didn't. It was, it was a lawsuit, and uh, they tried to explain it. And the only thing they could explain was at that time. Uh, Tanzania uh, was becoming uh, modernized. The school was taken over by Christians, which w was different than their traditional school, and these kids are in a state of upset. Anybody to think of any other kind of, kind of likewise behavior we've had in this country in the 1600s? Salem witch trials, almost all young girls. Uh, the Tarantella in Italy, same kind of thing. I don't know if they were girls or not. Uh, but this stuff is contagious. I think that's kind of cool. So I think we're going to show you. Oh, by the way, uh, it says it is accompanied by faint, fainting, flatulence, respiratory problems, rashes, crying, and screaming. The flatulence caused more, more laughter. Uh, but it was really pretty painful. And they, they, these authors describe a true laugh as containing snot and tears, usually. And we're going to get the next thing. So uh, gasping, gasping tears and snot. So let's listen to some contagious laughter. This fashion week over in Paris, the latest fashions are on the runway for next spring. But there was a problem out there today. One of the British designers shows had the difficulty. A model fell down twice. That's her going down once. The young woman wearing that pink skirt and the orange platform shoes never quite recovered after that. There she goes again. <laughs> <laughs> that had to hurt. That was uncool. That's embarrassing. This is at least the Let's second see. time. <laughs> well, you all are just really tickled by that, aren't you? You try walking in those shoes. Hey. First of all, baby, I got enough meat on me that it's all right. George. <laughs> I'm sorry. Come we, on, girl. We want to apologize. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> you want to You want me to be a boy? Oh, you're a dog. Oh, he lives to do that to me. <laughs> so, and this, this, I did this next one because Ray said so, he actually uh, listened to this person. Are you ready to take a call? Mm -hmm. Are you ready to take a call? Ray? I don't think I am. Are you uh, okay? Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> this guy just well, a little uh, burp. Put you over with Justin from Madisonville, Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm you. sorry, Justin? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Uh, my 
my question is about uh, spam on the internet. From from my, from my email, I mean. Hello. Great. You can't fake that. That's who I am. Uh, and this is one last leads to another. And this is a kind of uh, this, anybody old enough is, who knows who this is, who remembers. Herbert said it. Ed Wynn. Ed Wynn. And Ed Wynn was a vaudeville, vaudevillian, and um, he decided he decided to put him on radio, and it was deadly because there was no audience, and comedians need audience. I would not, I'm not funny anyway, but if you guys didn't show up, it would even be worse. So uh, they didn't know what to do. So one of his, the announcer, just grabbed some stage hands and some technicians, sat them in front of him, and they started laughing. And all of a sudden, Keenan Wynn became a funny guy. And he livened up, and the show was really successful. The interesting thing is the audience, the, the laughter was not for the listener. The laughter was for the comedian which I think is kind of neat. And then uh, this thing in the middle, I get it, is called uh, a clapper. And the French would hire people to applaud uh, at their shows. And Nero hired, didn't hire, told 5,000 people, 5,000 soldiers to applaud when he acted in, 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 uh, in public. Trump may be the same, I shouldn't say that, might do the same thing. But audience like to, la likes, like to laugh together. And if they're not laughing, it's just murder for the performer. Uh, and when, after radio, what came after radio? The internet? No, TV came after radio. And TV had a problem because they had these huge cameras and equipment, and they couldn't fit an audience, they couldn't fit an audience in. And they didn't know what, quite what to do. And this guy came up with his name, Robert, oh, what's his name? Don't do that to me. I can make it up, Robert Schwartz. But he really, he really has it. He really has a name. Uh, I just forgot it. Robert Douglas. It's Charles Douglas. Charles Robert. It's so close. So Charles Douglas is an engineer, kind of like our Steve Jolstrom. He's brilliant. And he worked on this machine right here. It's right here. And it's, it's the uh, laugh maker. Laugh maker. The laugh box. L-A-F-F-B-O-X. They used to sell really cheap ones to us, you know. Remember this? His was much better. OK. Enough. OK. So let's go up and try this. And now, this is Charlie Douglas's lap box. <laughs> For the last applause. So, as, as everybody in their, in, their, uh, in their young life has traumatic experiences, and that laugh box caused me a tra traumatic experience. I get PTSD over this thing. I, w I lived in a one bedroom apartment. And I slept, I slept in the living room, but before that, I was put to bed in my mom's bedroom. Then after the, I fell, fell asleep, they carried me in and put me to bed. Well, I'm laying in my bed, and I, they're watching I Love Lucy. And I hear this hysterical laughter. I am convinced the whole world is laughing, and I am missing it. And I started to whine, I started to scream, I started to yell. My parents don't put up with that very well. They just ignored me, nothing. It got, I go, I, as a little kid, I was sweating. It was awful. I was missing the greatest experience of life. And they finally picked me up, took me in a room, and it was boring as hell. But it was, <laughs> but it, I really, I, I can picture it today, exactly what happened. My mother forgave me. My father didn't. He was much tougher. Uh, let's go to the next one. All right.
Richard Weissman. Do you know Richard Weissman? Okay, well, Richard Weissman is a British researcher, very well known, and he decided in 2001, <coughs> using a gigolometer, to find the best joke in the world. And he started, he was one of the first people to use the internet, and he put this thing on and said, please send me your favorite joke. So it'd be a little thing. He got 1,500,000 responses. Within that, there were 40,000 different jokes. Uh, and he made some conclusions. The average, the best joke, I don't know why, has 103 letters in it. The best animal for a joke is a duck. So if you walk into a bar, don't walk in with a chimpanzee, walk in with a duck. Germans liked every joke. Scandinavians didn't like most jokes. But their submissions always ended with the word, ha ha. <laughs> Very strange. Their favorite time of the day for joke telling is 6 or 3 PM. On the 15th of the month, that's also income tax time, so it makes no sense to me. But it was Britain. Uh, the US, doesn't surprise me, they like insults and vague threats. And the example he uses, a text and says, where are you from? And the guy from Harvard says, I come from a place where we don't end sentences with prepositions. And the Texan says, OK, where are you from, jackass? <laughs> Which I think is really good. And uh, the British kind of like these kind of absurd or surreal joke. And this guy goes into a doctor's office and says, doctor, last night I made a Freudian slip. I was having dinner with my mother-in-law and wanted to say, could you please pass the butter? But instead, I said, you silly cow, you have completely ruined my life. <laughs> Put down humor is really liked by men. Women don't like it, especially when it puts down women. Uh, and the favorite joke within that one is where a policeman pulls up to a car and he, says, and he stops the car and he says, sir, sir, a mile back, your door opened up and your kids and your wife fell out. He says, thank God, I thought I was going deaf. So women don't like that joke. My wife, my wife laughed. Anyway, uh, I, I really, the best joke uh, would not be funny today as a result of experiences y uh, yesterday and this morning. If you want to hear it during coffee hour, I will tell you. I can tell you the second best joke, though. That's, they're really pretty stupid, but I'll tell you anyway. Here it is. Uh, so, uh, give me a second. A bit of a Holmes, uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson decide to go camping after, di and after dinner, and a bottle of wine they lay down for the night and go to sleep. Some hours later, Holmes awoke and nudged his faithful friend. Watson, look up at the sky and tell me what you see. Watson replied, I see millions of stars. What does that tell you? Watson pondered for a minute, and then he says, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Horologically, I deduce that the time is approximately a quarter past three. Theologically, I can see that God is all-powerful, and from that we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, I suspect that we'll have a beautiful day tomorrow. What does it tell you, Holmes? Holmes was silent for a minute and then spoke. Watson, you idiot, somebody stole our tent. <laughs> so that's the one that came, that's the one that came in second. What we found out is that what, what, what uh, Weissman discovered is that most, most jokes that are really popular are really pr pretty bland and not really funny, but that one, I thought it was pretty good. All right, excellent. Oh, long way. Let's go back. Be good, please. I think we're going backwards. We are. Really, it's deja vu. All over again, as, 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 as Yogi Berra would say. OK. So who knows who this guy is? Henny Youngman. Uh, I had the pleasure of living long enough to see Henny Youngman alive. Uh, 
This guy is a king of one-liners. Has anybody actually seen him live? Anybody seen him dead? Nice. He is, uh, he would go on for a 45 minute stint and do 105 jokes, one after the other, one after the other. And so I'm going to give, and his timing is just magnificent. I'm going to give the one on the left first. This one, left. <laughs> My wife hates housework. I bought electric iron, electric dishwasher, electric dryer. She said, too many gadgets around, she had no place to sit down. What did I do? Bought her electric chair. <laughs> I want you to notice what he does. You after must the compromise. Show. You must. After the joke, he does something that all comedians do. He stops. And he pauses. Anybody ever guess why he pauses? He pauses at the end of the joke. People thought they paused before the end of the joke. He pauses at the end. He's waiting for what? Laughter. He's waiting for the laughter. He's waiting for the, because laughter is contagious. It builds up, and all of a sudden he has great, great you know, humor. He, he performed for 70 years. Every single night, except the week that his wife died, and, now, and then the last week of his life, he didn't, didn't perform. Amazing man. Uh, and then he has the most famous line in all of Jokedom. You got it. <laughs> you know, it's short. How are you all? I'm glad to be here. Take my wife, please. That's it. That's the whole joke. I take my wife everywhere, but she finds it. So I read this thing. That people thought he invented this thing. And what happened is a stagehand, he spoke to the stagehand. He wanted her to sit down. He said, take my wife, please. And then he said, they thought that was funny and put it in the act and became uh, magnificently famous. Let's see what we got. All right, this is the one that relates mo most like today. Uh, anybody know who this guy is? Godfrey. Yeah, Gil Gilbert Godfrey. So Gilbert Godfrey was at, a, 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 at the Friars Club about a month after 9-11. And they were roasting Hugh Hefner. And I got to get a couple of jokes he told. And Jimmy Kimmel asked him to come up and to roast Hefner. 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 <laughs> Hefner. <laughs> That's a Freudian slip. Uh, <laughs> never mind. And the first joke he said, we did one joke about, about Hefner uh, eating Viagra, then gave Hefner the Muslim sounding name, hasn't been laid yet, and then decided to go for broke saying he had to leave early because he, he uh, so he's, he, he had to leave early for California, but he couldn't get a direct flight. So the only flight he could get would have to stop it at the Empire State Building. Two weeks after 9-11, people started booing. People started screaming, not yet, too early, too early. Terrible joke. Most comedians would have either left the stage or they would have gone back to very mild stuff. Instead, he did this, this amazing thing. Uh, has anybody seen the movie The Aristocrats? Yes. It is the most vulgar, disgusting joke known to humankind. So he said, I'm going to play, no, I can't play the joke, because it would never be the ethical society again, but I'll play the beginning of the joke, and you can get the idea. By the way, you can get the, uh, the movie The Aristocrats. There's one movie that Walt Disney made that sounds like it, but that's the years to cats. Not the same. So don't get this home for your kids. Uh, let's go. A talent agent is sitting in his office. A no American family walks in. A ah, father and mother, son and daughter, a big fluffy dog. They, the family has blonde hair and blue eyes and bright skin. And uh, the talent agent looks up and goes, all right, let's see what you do. So the father drops his pants and takes off his shirt. He's totally naked. He undresses his wife. That's enough. It gets grosser and grosser and grosser. The audience started to laugh. And by the end, they were, these are all comedians and actors. They were rolling on the floor. It said it was, it was, it sound, it sounded like a, uh, a, a, a human tracheotomy. 
thousands of people, hundreds of people laughing at once. And it's become extremely, extremely well known and very famous. And, but, it, but it would be like telling a joke in El Paso today. You know, it'd be, it'd be a little, little bitty tough. Next one. This is interesting. So um, the guy Provine spends a lot of time on laughter. And he says, laughter is instinctive behavior. It's programmed into our brains. It brings people together or it could be used as a weapon, which is probably true. Speakers laugh more than audience. So next time somebody tells you a joke, you'll notice they're laughing before the joke is finished, before you start. Comedians don't do that. They never laugh at the end of their joke, unless they're unsuccessful. Uh, and they'll be a little sexist here. Uh, women, uh, and women more, more at men than men at women. And I'll show you some proof. Laughing is a movement that produces sound. And uh, Provine goes into a lot of this. So let's go through. This is a little more complicated, but you guys can handle it. So these are, I got to use this thing. So Provine went out and he had literally hundreds of people respond to his students. They walk up to you and say, I'm doing a laugh experiment. Would you please laugh? And people do for some reason. And, he, and he, so he recorded all these things. And then he, uh, they had uh, sonograms. So this one up here, if I can get it, is a male laughing. Uh, this is the un, un uh, uh, okay, I say it, 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 it's the raw data. This, and this data has been processed. And if you notice, laughter looks like a string of beads. It's very equally spaced apart. Uh, I'm not a musician, but these are their harmonics. Somebody might know what that means, but they're all very even. Laughter tends to trail off at the end. This is another male laughing. You can see how symmetrical it is and how even it is. This is a chimp. Chimp has all this stuff in the middle. And I'll try to explain that in a minute. This is three women. It's a little different, but not much. This woman, he said, started out by going, <laughs> said, hey, that's that part. Uh, and this is another woman another, and another woman. This is the man and the male on top. Uh, when people laugh, there's only certain styles that work, and maybe you'll be able to figure out why. People laugh, ha, 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 ho, 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 he, 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 ha, ho, I love doing this. Ho, ha, 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 ha. This is how he taught. Uh, ha, 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 he. Ha, ha, ho, ho, he. But you can't do ha, ho, ha, ho, ha. Can't do it. He, ho, he, ho, he, ho. We're off to work we go. No, that's, um, but it's interesting because if you try to laugh, what must you be doing? Breathing which way? Out. Out. So laughter is always on an exhale. Chimps don't do that. And we'll show you what goes on. And chimps can't laugh, sadly. Chimps have a great sense of humor, by the way. And they understand language. There's that, that Washoe, which is that famous chimp that could do sign language, or understood sign language. His, he was, his, his uh, trainer was carrying him on his shoulder, and Washoe peed on his shoulder. And then he signed funny, which is really cool. I thought that was really neat. I knew it would make you laugh. And uh, so I got this one thing here. Hold on. I don't see it. I don't see him doing that, so it might be later. I might have missed something up. Uh, we're going to go on a little bit and then. Well, I'll talk about it anyway. Chimps, humans are the only, the only bipedal primate, or primate and, the, and really one of the few mammalians that walks on two, on, on two legs. And things that are, are quadrupeds, they walk like this. Obviously, four quadrupeds. And their, their steps are synchronized with their breathing. So if you want to lift something really heavy, what do you do with your breath? You want to lift something, what is it time? Try it, imagine it. Just try to lift something. What do you guys do? You hold your breath. So that we do that occasionally, but chimps and other quadrupeds always do that. 
so they can't, they can't be exhaling when they're walking, because every step is a breath, which is pretty, really pretty cool. And uh, he goes back and talks, uh, Proline goes back and talks about that being evolutionary. So the laugh probably preceded speech, very, you know, and the, uh, he said, okay, got it, sorry. And uh, so the laugh preceded speech, and our speech was only enabled when we became bi bipedal, when we could walk on two legs, which is really kind of cool. Uh, birds can do it too, but different deal. The ducks can't laugh. And there it is. Can chimps ha ha? Can chimps ha ha? No, no. May humans go ha 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 ha, and then chimps have to go ah uh, ha uh, they they all they all they alternate which i think is really kind of cool and next one be nice be good uh i love these two pieces so uh this is the okay laughing record which is a, which sold a million a million records in 1922 which is gigantic and i'm gonna play it for you on you after a while. Uh, I'm gonna, we're going to play this one in intermission, but this one's, this is Jelly Roll Morton, and he's doing the, uh, the hyena stunt. And he's an accomplished musician. So. You'll hear it later. Uh, Chimp smile. One of the few animals that actually can smile. They smile. What it did, if they want their mom to tickle them, which they, they seem to really like, they tend to bite at the mom. She tickles them, and when they're satisfied, they smile. As soon as she over tickles them, <sniffs> smile's gone, and she leaves them alone. Uh, whether we believe it or not, dogs don't smile. We think they do, but they really don't. They can't. I tried to figure out how this one worked, and my guess is that is on a boat, and the wind is blowing his, 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 his mouth back. They, but they can make expressions. But he ain't smiling, and this one's not smiling either. So we read dogs in a much more varied kind of way. Uh, we're going to move this along, because I always run late. I don't want to quite run that late. So Provine did this, this huge experiment, 52 questionnaires, 420 responses. You can read it. A whole, a whole bunch of people. And he asked them if they were tickled recently. And this amazes me. 35% had been tickled in the past week. 86% had been tickled in the past year. 40% had been tickled somewhere in the past, past week. I tickled someone else in the past week. 84% had tickled someone in the past year. And people younger than 40 are 10 times more likely to have been tickled in the last week. When you get old, you stop tickling people. Uh, not always. Well, the one 86-year-old lady said she, uh, she was through. Uh, so I don't know if this is baby torture or not, but it's kind of fun to listen to how a baby uh, gets tickled. By the way, uh, you want to tickle somebody, an adult? The underarm is the most tickable spot. Then the waist, then the ribs, then the foot, then the knee, then the throat, then the neck, and then the palm. Nobody's ever tickled me on my palm. Ever? <laughs> Excuse me? Excuse me? That's not what we're just to be saying. Hey. Don't you ever 
Don't you ever. <laughs> it's fun with doing it. <laughs> 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 if you can't tickle him, kiss him on the belly. It works every time. <laughs> Who remembers this guy? He's perfect. I love the end when he gives up. But... This is getting a little scientific. Uh, I'm going to skip that. We want to move on. But these are pairs. Uh, the S is the speaker. The A is the, audi is the audience. And I'm pointing at the thing again. Uh, I can't do this. S is the speaker. A is the audience. And male, male, female, female, male, female, etc. Female speakers laugh, laugh the most no matter who the audience is. Males are the best laugh getters, and male speakers laugh when their audience is male. I'm going to move along because I think there's some stuff that's interesting. And I knew I'd run late because I always do that. They did uh, personal ads because they didn't have Match.com, and they sent out they examined hundreds, of, hundreds of ads. Men want physical attractiveness and offer financial security. No surprise, women offer physical attractiveness and seek financial resources. When a sense of humor is mentioned, men offer that they have it, and the women said they want it. It looks like that's changing as women become emancipated in our ridiculous world. Uh, and I go up. And see, I didn't think this was funny. I thought, I thought this was funnier. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so humor can be, a, can be used as ridicule. It separates us. Uh, there's you know, Polish jokes and Jewish jokes and black jokes and lawyer jokes, which are all funny. And um, I even looked up wasp jokes. They're really not funny. Uh, sorry. Anyway, uh, so this is, I've never seen this guy tell a joke or do any humor. This is about as close as he got where he, where he made fun of the New York Times reporter who had a disability. Uh, so humor, humor can really be mean. And, and this is uh, Norman Cousins. And this, I'm sure some of you remember that. Uh, Norman Cousins was an American political, he was a journalist, he was an a, a international kind of arbiter. And he got really, I'm going to keep this really short, he got really, really ill. They didn't, they didn't give him much chance to even survive. He stayed on his medication, but he watched The Three Stooges several times a day and a few other, car, a few other funny movies. And miraculously, he did a lot better. And he was convinced that laughing is indeed the best medicine. And he, you know, he, he wrote this very famous book, Anatomy of an Illness. Uh, Reader's Digest had a column called La Laughter is the Best Medicine each month. Uh, he said, laughter is, is inner jogging. And he's just a very amazing man. And we can get to the end. Hold on. This is not a toilet. This, this, is, this is ice that was is like 30 water. It's 35 degrees. And they put people's hands in it. Also put uh, blood pressure cuffs and squeeze it until it caused pain. And then they'd show a funny movie. And they watched how long they could tolerate it. And People tolerated it more with watching the funny movie. The problem was they also tolerated watching a horror flick. So it, wasn't, it did, didn't quite pan out the way they expected it. Uh, 
there was a prediction that people who are, who are happy will live, live a lot longer. Probably not true. All these people died young. Uh, and uh, 12 by natural causes and four ODs and two suicides. You probably recognize most of them. And that's sad. This probably has to do with their, their lifestyle and traveling and pressure and, and abuse, uh, uh, substance, abuse, substance abuse. And here we go, next one. These guys all live to 90. She, uh, uh, Carol Channing, who is up here, she passed away, so we, got it, we should cross her off. But the rest of these people are, are over 90, still kicking, so it doesn't kill them all. Uh, this guy be, lived, lived to become God. Uh, this is Patch Adams, and he's just, if you, if you haven't seen the movie, go see it. He's a real person. The movie is really, I'm not going to play it. That's the, it, that's the intro. Wonderful, wonderful man. This is the real picture. He brought laughter to the hospitals. He started the Gesundheit Institute, which is basically a non-for-profit uh, hospital in West Virginia. And then once a year, you take, the Swiss leaves next week. Uh, it's the 14th event where he takes literally over 100 people, volunteers, you have to pay, but it's cheap, and you go down to Berlin, which is probably the poorest town in, in Peru, and you act as a clown, and you cheer people up. And they said it's just a phenomenal experience. So if you leave here, go, go to his website. And This is good, good one, good, good one to end, end, end at ethical. And we'll I don't end. understand why people have a problem with joy in church. <laughs> we have to try this here. Because you can come to church all happy, excited, talking to your friend. The moment you walk in the door, everybody's stirring, you know, they're sitting there. You don't want to even cough. You, know, you don't want to even open up a mint because now you're in the presence of God. It's all right. This, this is called joy. It's okay. The Lord's in total favor of it. You can have some. God's not grumpy. He's not throwing furniture around. Um, Jesus is not depressed. So Jesus didn't come to condemn. If you look at a lot of religious people, that's all they're doing. Yeah. Maybe it's because if I can keep them guilty or ashamed, then I'm going to keep them coming back. I mean, religion is like that, isn't it? Are you kind of giving away the, uh, the um, formula? I mean, it doesn't matter. I, the, my thing is to release everybody's. Touch your Lord. Touch your Jesus. Touch your Jesus. The best way I could describe it is drunkenness like you're inebriated i mean you're you're there you're aware of what's going on but you don't really want to stop when somebody gets prayed for and they fall out on the ground they're kind of just laying there we kind of call that carpet time right now right now right now sandwich just became toast hallelujah thank you jesus <laughs> this is my friend from Canada. He's a laughologist. <laughs> he is. He's a laughologist. <laughs> and he's come to study what's happening here. can't laugh, get some laughing gas, and the, the last thing in the book, they mentioned that marijuana works just as well as laughing gas, and, uh, and it's greener. So <laughs> thank you. Have a good time. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, you kind of touched on it near the end with the um, marginalized group, like the groups that we mm -hmm. make jokes about. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with a, a humorous, a writer and political commentary woman named Lindy West, who wrote a book called Shrill. And anybody who's interested in sort of the decomposition of com comedy from a feminist perspective might 
find it an interesting book. Um, but one of her, she's the woman who got engaged in the, is our rape jokes funny? I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago, um, there was this huge thing about rape jokes just aren't funny. And what does that mean? Why can we declare a topic off, you know, off limits for humor? And um, she goes through a critique of that. But I think it, there's an issue in the modern era, and I'm just curious if this makes sense or if you kind of can filter through this, is a changing sense of humor as power and establishing power and othering people. It used to be Italians or whatever, mm -hmm. and, and there's intrinsically possibly um, male. Dom, you know, mm -hmm. A lot of your statistics could have reinforced the idea that humor looks different to men and women and that we accept as humorous jokes that inherently reflect male in, source, in, state, in positions of power. And how, does it, how do we use that insight going forward and agreeing things can be funny, but some things are hurtful? And that some people find them funny, but they really are at the expense of other people. So uh, I think I got this. Oh, you got something. So I, uh, what I read is almost every community has the outsides and the ins. Even within the same town, uh, in, in, in Ireland, one group three blocks away thinks that it, they're called the stupid jokes. They automatically they call it, they label the other ones as stupid. The male and female stuff is interesting because when they came back and started looking at things with them, where the woman became the boss, everything switched. You know, I, once the woman became the boss, she she told a joke, you know, the, the male laughed. So it, it it's it's fluid and it's going to change. I hope. I hope. I don't know. Primates can smile. You said dogs can't smile. Dogs about, can't smile. How about cats? <laughs> they, they make great t-shirts is what they do. <laughs> Hi. Um, okay. I think all of us have had experiences like when you said, when you said, you know, real laughter is when you're, you're tearing right. and snot comes out of your nose. Tell me your remembrance of one personal story where that happened to you. Uh, I think the one where the kid told me I was, uh, why, asked me why I was wearing those. those. I was pretty well gone. Uh, my family actually pees. That's the problem. <laughs> My, 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 my sister goes, oh my God, oh my God. Does, anybody have that in their family? Yeah, occasionally, good. Not that I would ever dare reveal the country, the, my country of origin, but why do we seem to have so many comedians coming from Canada? Low expectations. <laughs> I don't know. The Canadians are nice. Yeah, you know, I, I think. Yeah, I don't know. That's good. But more, more and more, and and you know, all minorities now are really dominating humor. And uh, somebody says, you know, if you have enough, you know, tragedy that lasts long enough, you start you start adding punchlines onto the stories, which I think is pretty good. Where are we going? There it is. So um, we had that stand-up comedian come and talk a little bit yeah, about humor. Laura but, Hug. Um, what did you learn about um, what it means to be a comedian? I mean, obviously there are many different styles, so it's not like one formula. But w what do they have in common? What they have in common is practice. Number one, they just keep practicing and keep practicing and keep practicing, and have tremendous courage. Because when there's no audience, you die. And then the little, and then the little things like you don't step on your own punchline, which is a, which is something I didn't know. And most people, when we tell a joke, we stop before we do the punchline, which is ridiculous. So it's uh, there are certain skills. There she goes. Okay, Matt. I know you taught for many years, so I have a very serious question for you. Did you ever meet any administrators with a sense of humor? Yeah. <laughs> I really did. Maureen Cheever was the funniest person I think I've ever known. She was fabulous. She, was re she could crack up anybody, and she was a great administrator. Uh, there is a correlation between s supposedly sense of humor and intelligence, and I'm, I'm working on my sense of humor. 
but seriously, uh, people who are, are, are quick and who can make puns and can you know, do double entendres tend, tend to be uh, smarter. I don't know. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I think, I mean, I, I think my favorite comedian is Stephen Wright. You know, he just sees the world in a whole different way. He's just incredibly brilliant. You know? I just have to say that one of the reasons I married Matt Cole yeah. was because he made me laugh all the time. Ha uh, ha. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Did you find anything um, on the health benefits of laughter. I mean, you did mention well, there was. The age I mean, there's a, whole, there's a whole bunch, and it makes people feel better. It doesn't seem to cure anything, but people but feel people feel better, and people feel better, they are better. So it, it, it definitely increases the quality of life. Norman, I mean, Cousins was was right. It does make your life your life better. It, it does not increase your your, your lifespan and get rid of diseases. So far, you can get rid of friends. Hey, man. Um, I, just on a personal observation, I always thought that humor was part of the mating ritual among people. Was part of Men, the mating ritual. The, the humor was part of the mating oh, ritual among people. Tickle, tickling is. Well, but even so, like, if you look at high school kids, the boys are always trying to make the girls laugh, and the girls are constantly laughing at things that aren't funny. And it seems as, as we go forward, the idea that women will step up and start making jokes puts many men, I think, in the saying, hey, that's my job. You know? But is there anything in your research that showed that I, making I, women laugh is well, clearly, a clearly on, 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 the, on the ads for, date, for dating services, women, women ask that men have a sense of humor and men brag that they have a sense of humor. Uh, and in the tickling stuff too, it's the it's the the men do the tickling. Uh, the women don't like it, by the way, most of the time, and men do it. So that it's dominance, and it's you know it's I don't know if it's I don't know if it's it, it, it's what mating behavior shouldn't be, in my own opinion. We'll tickle together, nightmare. Okay. Yes, ma'am. When I was 15, I'm 67, so it was a while ago. I was, um, it was a sorority scene or something. We went to a nightclub, and Jackie Leonard oh, teased me. I was 15, I was smoking back then. Who knew? I looked like I was nine, and he got me from the audience. And I didn't think of that until just you. Funny man. Coming up. Funny, yeah. funny man. It's pretty cool. Okay. Any other questions? Got it. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.